این جا این جا اسمش he was born in a village a village in the heart of the desert At the age of five, he became the shepherd of the village, a little shepherd who with bare feet would take the sheep of the villagers to graze. At night, his mother would remove the thorns from his hands and feet with a needle. The entire autumn and winter, his hands would be black due to the cold weather and the work. Every time the teacher would hit the back of his hand with a wet pomegranate branch and he would cry, his father would shout from the courtyard of their house, Don't hit him, O oh unjust! Qasim's hand isn't dirty, his skin has become bruised. And as far as he could remember, he would always wait for the summer to arrive and bring warmth along with it. Even though his hand didn't fire any bullets, it did stop many from shedding the blood of innocent people. And since the moment he fell on the ground, no other hand on the earth has warmly shook the hand of another. The man who had a wide forehead and a large stature which was suitable for standing tall. At the age of 13, he found out the secret behind his parents' whispers at night. He found out that his father owed 900 tumans to the farmer's bank and was unable to return it. So he decided to give up on his education and he went to the city to find work and repay his father's loan.
This was the first time that he was taking up such a huge responsibility, but he handled it well. Later, he took karate classes at Kerman's Workers' Club, and on its card was written, Go get stronger if you desire the comforts of the world, because in the system of nature, the weak are trampled. This was to become his life's motto. He would have to strengthen his shoulders to take up even bigger responsibilities. من پاسدار قاسم سلیمانی عضو کادر سپاه پاسداران کرمان آموزشی که ملاحظه میکنیم برادران میبینن آموزش فروت و صعود از کوه یا آموزش فشرده چریکی When the Islamic Revolution took place, he wanted to join the IRGC, but with that curly hair of his and short-sleeved shirt from which his hands and chest were visible, his appearance wasn't like the other IRGC soldiers, and hence he was rejected in the IRGC selection. But his insistence worked and paid off, and he became a soldier. But it was destined for his right hand to get injured. That too, on the first day of the first operation that he was a part of. But because of his experience in military affairs and his ability to guide the forces, he stayed on the battlefront. And even though he was a military commander, he would become friends with each of his soldiers and would build a personal and emotional relationship with them. In the first leave he received, he went to Mecca for Hajj. After that, everyone called him by the following name, Hajj Qasim. During the eight years of the war in the sacred defense, he fought in different places. He fought in the mountains and the rivers, he fought in the deserts and in the Gulf. And in his conversations, on his wireless walkie-talkie, he never said go. Rather, he would always say come, for he was at the forefront. When the situation would get tough, he would have an aura that no one dared to disagree with his opinion. Everyone knew that when Hajj Qasim raises his right eyebrow, there's no place for ifs and buts, and no one can say no. In the eight years that Hajj Qasim and the Islamic Republic's soldiers were busy fighting Saddam's army on the western border, drug mafias had invaded Iran's eastern and southeastern provinces bordering Afghanistan and Pakistan. Hence, the IRGC established a force to fight this drug mafia, the Quds Force, and Hajj Qasim became the commander of this force. 
Haj Qasim's new mission was more difficult than the sacred defense war. For the drug mafias mainly employed the poor and the local people of various different villages within the same province. And the difficulty of Haj Qasim's mission was that he was supposed to clear these provinces with maximum peace and minimum casualties. <laughs> Even though the Mafia lords tried to put Haj Qasim in a very tight spot by threatening him continuously, but he, having gone to the brink of death multiple times and once almost having his children taken hostage, did his job without hesitation. Once, when armed insurgents took 90 policemen hostage and took them to Pakistan, Haj Qasim followed them in a helicopter and after finding their hideout, he ordered, on his own responsibility, to outflank them and free the hostages. Now, the drug mafia leaders had well understood that they weren't even safe from the reach of Haj Qasim even on the other side of the border. Haj Qasim called the remaining insurgent units and asked them to either surrender their weapons or await the consequences of their mischief. <laughs> Yet again, it was the season for forgiveness and kindness. Haj Qasim tried to provide these tribes a dignified life through farming by constructing hundreds of water wells. He even looked after the family of a well-known notorious armed insurgent who was killed by his forces. In this way, after seven years, Haj Qasim was successful in restoring security in both the eastern and southeastern provinces of the Islamic Republic of Iran with the least number of casualties. But this wasn't the end of his missions. What secret was in this name that it had intertwined itself with Haj Qasim's life? He started his military training from the Quds garrison in Kirman. His first operation as a commander of war was Tariq al-Quds operation. He fought the drug mafias in the Quds corps, and now he was commanding the Quds force. Yet, there were many such secrets in Haj Qasim's life.
The beginning of Hajj Qasim's new mission coincided with the beginning of the construction of American bases around the Islamic Republic of Iran. The Al-Qaeda group too had infiltrated the region and was sowing the seeds of religious sedition. Qasim Soleimani had to do something about it. First, he went to meet Ahmad Shah Massoud in a helicopter via the mountains of Tajikistan. The Sunni lion of the Panjshir Valley in Afghanistan had long gone into seclusion and isolation. Can I ask you what you did with the weapon? What did you do with the weapon? Every weapon is a good weapon. Now, Hajj Qasim had to do something about it. Hajj Qasim took Ahmad Shah Mas'ud out of self-isolation by strengthening his fighting and combat power in that area and supporting his forces. He even transferred heavy military equipment to the other side of Afghanistan in just 48 hours. The next destination was Kurdistan, Iraq, the place of Islamic Iran's traditional and cultural allies. There, Hajj Qasim strengthened and expanded his relationship with the leaders of this region, just like in Afghanistan. Giving military training and sending military equipment and gear deepened Hajj Qasim's relationship with the Kurds. <laughs> The next step of Hajj Qasim was going to Lebanon. And it was there where he found his lost one, Imad Mughniya. A versatile commander just like himself, and Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah, who was a strategist, a political theorist, and aware of regional equations in the world, and at the same time, a full-fledged fighter all at once. These two individuals became the strength of Hajj Qasim's heart. Companions who never left each other, and it was only shahadat and martyrdom which separated them. وضع الأساليب والطرائق للعمل الأصل لكن الأصل الرئيسي هو الروحي الروح it wasn't long after Hajj Qasim Soleimani's acquaintance with Imad Mughniya and Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah that the Israeli army left Lebanon after 18 years of occupation without the slightest of concessions.
six years later, the small entity of Hezbollah had grown so much that Israel decided to uproot it with an extensive attack. But Haj Qasim wasn't someone who would sit and watch the battle from afar. خب اون وقت هنوز جنگ گستره اصلیش تمرکز بر ساختمانهای اداری حزب الله داشت و بر جنوب جنگ کاملا جنگ متفاوتی بود جنگ خیلی جنگ تکنولوژی بود دقیق بود ساختمان های دوازده طبقه با یه بمب با زمین یکسان می شدند اهداف با دقت انتخاب می شد در درون روستاها که روستا فاصله یک روستا با روستای دیگر فاصله چسبیده به همی داشتند برای توپ خانه ها کار سخت است یک روستایی که شیعه نشین بود با روستایی دیگری که برادران مسیحی ما بودن یا برادران علی تسنن بودن کاملا متفاوت بودن یک جا یک نفر با اطمینان نشسته بود مشغول کشیدن قلیون بود یک جا یک جا چندین هزار گلوله فرود می آمد. Two weeks after the start of the war, Israel tried its best to force Lebanon to accept defeat by massacring the people and destroying critical infrastructure. فسعى سعيك وناصب جهدك فوالله لن تمحو ذكرنا ولن تميت وحينا فما جمعك إلا بدد ولا أيامك إلا عدد وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين از روز بیسهشتم جنگ بالعکس شد و بعد از این سقوط رژیم شروع شد یعنی زدن تانک ها از اینجا بعد معادله جدید آمد اولین موشک های کرنت در این جنگ رونمایی شد اولین تانک های میرکاب های اسرائیلی که تا حالا به این شکل زده نشده دادن نزدیک هفت تا تانک در یک روز زده شد بالامس فقدتم اکثر من 25 جندیا و عشرات الدبابات حزب الله ما زال يقصفكم بالصواريخ ولم تستطيعون تجريده من سلاحه اذا ماذا حققتم في كل هذه الحمله
During the victory celebration, only a few people knew about the existence of a person called Imad Mufti. But this spirit of resistance had a strong support next to him during all the days of the war. Two years later, Israel, with a great greed for a victory, even if it was a small one, went after the Gaza Strip. But again, it was too late. The Gaza Strip had missiles. How these long-range missiles were sent to a besieged Gaza Strip is still a mystery for the Israeli army. Missiles that caused an army which had fired rockets on the Gaza Strip for 22 days in the year 2008 to accept a ceasefire within 48 hours in the year 2018. Haj Qasim Soleimani and Shaheed Imad Mughniya had made an impossible mission very much possible. Haj Qasim Soleimani was now no longer worried about the Palestinian resistance being alive. The only vital and vulnerable point of the resistance was its head, that is, Syria. Going to Syria, that too at a time when the world media was interpreting the crisis in Syria as a continuation of the Arab revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia and Libya, was a big question mark, even for Hajj Qasim's friends. A question that had no answer for a long time except for trusting Hajj Qasim. ما وقتی رفتیم به مقابله با تکفیر که دوستان ما ما را نصیحت می‌کردند انقلاب را محترم حفظ کنید این دوستان هم در کشور بودند در داخل کشور در سطوح عالی و هم در خارج کشور که دوستداران انقلاب ما بودند می‌گفتند محترم بمانید محترم باشید مسلمان‌ها شما را دوست دارند انقلاب را دوست دارند وارد این موضوعات نشوید شما وارد سوریه نشوید شما وارد عراق نشوید وارد این مناقشات خودتون نکنید خب یه فکر اینجا خیلی ها هم استدلال میکردن پیرامونش استدلال شان استدلال ضعیفی نبود One year later, finally the day came when Damascus, the capital of Syria, was on the verge of collapse. The Free Syrian Army, with the official support of the American Army, was advancing towards Damascus from one side. 
while the Syrian branch of Al-Qaeda, also known as Al-Nusra Front, with fighters from different countries around the world and financial and logistical support from Saudi Arabia, Turkey and Qatar from the other side. The popular opposition to the Syrian government was just beginning to discover the dimensions and the reality of the whole story. But as much as the resistance fighters resisted, the opposition front, to which the UAE had now been added to, provided more money, more equipment and more facilities to the Syrian government's armed opposition. Until an armed militant terrorist group called ISIS join them. And one year later, when ISIS had captured large areas of Syria, a part of its troops decided to go towards Iraq. This spreading fire of ISIS had now reached 45 kilometers from the Islamic Republic of Iran. Haj Qasim Soleimani had reached the Battle of ISIS when ISIS had already reached Samara by occupying both the cities of Mosul and the city of Tikrit. Haj Qasim Soleimani had predicted this situation months ago, but some Iraqi politicians didn't take his words seriously. The Kurdish leader thought that the threat of ISIS was ultimately the issue and the matter of the central government of Iraq, not the Kurdish people. أعطيني طريق فقط لا أريد منك شيء بس أعطيني طريق حتى لا تهجر الناس من تلك المنطقة فقال له مسعود البرزاني قال خلونا على التل المشكلة 
مشكلة داعش مع نور المالكي وليس داعش مشكلتها مع العراق فقال له الحاج قال ستهجر الناس وهذا كله لأنه ما أعطيتنا طريق حتى ندافع عنه نساؤنا تسنى والدباع في سوق الرق رجاء أخوان رجاء أخوان سيد النائب الآن هناك حملة إبادة جماعية على المكون اليزيدي سيد النائب بأيدة. نعم سيد الرئيس أنا ملتزمة رجاء السيد الرئيس أهلي يذبحون أهلي يذبحون كما ذبح كل العراقيين ذبح الشيعة والسنة والمسيحيين والتركمان والشبك واليوم يذبح اليزيديين 48 ساعة 30 ألف عائلة محصورة في جبل سنجار بدون ماء بدون أكل يموتون 70 طفل لحد الآن ماتوا من العطش والاختناق 50 شيخ مات من من الوضع المتردي نساؤنا تسبى كجرايا جاريات والدباع في سوق الرق سيد الرئيس نطالب البرلمان العراقي بالتدخل الفوري لايقاف هذه المذبحه ولكن اقول لك اذا يوم من الايام طلبت مساعدتي ساذهب لنجدتك قالها حاج قاسم وخرج وهو غاضب فيتصل تلك الليلة الظلماء مسعود برزاني يا حاج أريد أن أراك شو صار؟ قال داعش على أعتاب الأربيل داعش دخلت إلى محافظة أربيل أريد نجدتك فما انتظر حاج قاسم أن يصير صباحا تلك الليلة وهو يدخل إلى أربيل Haj Qasim Soleimani went to Erbil immediately and stopped the attack of ISIS with only 70 people. The Erbil siege was broken, but the main danger still remained. Haj Qasim needed to very quickly organize the volunteer and public forces, a task that needed dozens of skilled field military commanders and especially native Arabic speakers. وصل عندي في الساعة الثانية عشر ليلة وقال أنا أذكر قال لي الآن الساعة اثنى عشر مع طلوع الفجر أنا أريد منكم مئة وعشرين قائد عمليات من اللبنانيين وأنا قلت له حجي الساعة اثناش بالليل يعني من أين أنا أأتيك بمئة وعشرين قائد عمليات قال أنا لا أريد منكم مقاتلين أنا أريد منكم قادة عمل يعني فرمندهان ميداني فهو بقي معي وقمنا نتصل بالأخوة واحدا واحدا Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah's efforts continued until the morning call to prayer. Haj Qasim left Sayyid Nasrullah's office accompanied by dozens of Hezbollah's field commanders from Beirut and with others waiting for him at the Damascus airport. طبعا كانت يعني شعرت في تلك الليلة أن الدنيا كلها عند الحاج قاسم هي العراق أنا قلت له قلت حجي أنت أنا الإخوة أخبروني أنك في طريق بغداد صمراء أنت كنت في الموكب في الحركة باتجاه صمراء وهذا كان عمل خطير وكذا قال لم يكن هناك خيار آخر كان علي أنا أن أمشي حتى يمشي الآخرون أيضا الوقت وقت ضيق جدا لا نستطيع أن نقاتل بحسابات يجب أن نقاتل بحسابات مختلفة
In those days, Hajj Qasim Soleimani was nearly martyred many times, just like the many Iraqi youths who were fighting alongside him. And the code word of all these epics was a single fatwa. Even though the presence of Hajj Qasim in Syria and Iraq was official, his support in the battle against the terrorists were the volunteer Popular Mobilization Forces, the PMU. In those days, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis was his right-hand man in organizing these forces in Iraq. These young people were often less familiar with military affairs. The thing that made them resort to armed defense was saving the lives of their people and the worry that the Americans would return under the pretext of fighting ISIS. Come on, come on, 
اي والله اني متعمل جن يومهم Towards the end of the year 1396, early 2018, the tables of war had turned. By then, Mosul, the self-proclaimed capital of ISIS in Iraq, and then most of the ISIS-occupied territories in Syria, had been liberated one after the other. Haj Qasim had done his job. He had been successful in forming an efficient, fast, and flexible force consisting of the people. A force that could help its country's army in the face of any threat. Apart from the Lebanese, Iraqi, and Syrian resistance fighters, volunteers from Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the Islamic Republic of Iran also gradually joined this team. <laughs> اگر بدترین همراه ها را داشتن چی تر بودن؟ آدم اگه میخواه بره قلده کوه بلندی بره اگه همراهش آدم های هموزن این قلده نباشن تو را زمین گیرش میکنه متوقفش میکنه اما اگه آدم های همراه این راه آدم های بودن که این قلده را نتن قلده را میپیماین آدم را هم میگیرم میبرن هم راه خودش انسان احساس اتمیلان میکنم These youths earned the name of the defenders of the shrine سلامتی آجیان سلامت اتمیلان اللهم سلام وقتی میگیم مدافع حرم فقط منظور حضرت زینب سلام الله علیه مجمعین و حضرت رقیه سلام الله علیه مجمعین و حضرت سوچه نیست مثلا خیلی بزرگتر و وزیدتر از اوناست یعنی اونها هم اگه بودن همین مدافع حرم می شدن اگه حضرت زینب بود امام حسین بود مدافع حرم می شد اما حرم حرم دین حرم اسلام حرم انسانیت این حرم این فلسفه را مقام از اون رحبری بیردن فرمودن که اگر در اونجا با ایران مقابله نکنیم الان مصداق ایران را زدن اما همین الان ما در افغانستان برای داره ما اونجا با گمگذاری های وحشتناکی مواجه هستن هشتاد نفر، سی نفر، پنجا نفر تو مساجد شهید میشن یعنی دامنه این جریان خطرناک سیاه و هر کجا میرسد جز ایرانی چی ندارد In the year 2017, ISIS seemed to have been finished. But America tried to protect the remnants of ISIS by creating a no-fly zone over the Iraq-Syria border. This remote border town was the last focus point of the ISIS on the west of the Euphrates, a place which was impossible to capture even by someone like Haj Qasim according to the calculations of the American army. But things turned out to be quite different. Kamtar as three months later, the Islam of Daesh and the government of Daesh will be in this country. Thank you. 
Haj Qasim personally took command of this operation. His plan of attack was an extraordinary Haj Qasim first freed the northern towns of Bukamal and then, contrary to everyone's expectations, transferred his troops to the gates of Bukamal via the most unlikely route possible. A path through the burning Syrian deserts. Only a few people around Haj Qasim knew the reason for his sneezing and his coughing. These were the side effects of his exposure to chemical weapons used against the Islamic Republic of Iran during the Eight-Year War, the sacred defense which had become more severe during the battle for the liberation of Aleppo in Syria. Hussein Pur Ja'fari, Haj Qasim's bodyguard, was one of these people. He, who was Haj Qasim's constant companion since the war, knew well that the difficulty caused by the chemical weapons to Haj Qasim was not this coughing, but the painful blisters which covered his feet from time to time. The hiding of ISIS among the people made it difficult to completely clear each and every house of Bukamal. It was just as difficult to clear the other cities of Syria. In such a situation, the resistance forces had no way of identifying the ISIS suicide bombers from among the refugees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
The shadow of ISIS was present everywhere. This ominous shadow scared the people and the resistance forces from each other. Having experienced the behavior of ISIS, the scared and terrified people of the city thought that the resistance forces were the same as ISIS. In this way, the city of Bu Kamal was liberated before other cities and was returned to the hands of the people. Haj Qasim was waiting for the Iraqi Popular Mobilization Forces, the PMU, a force that was supposed to join them at this point from within Iraq via the city of Al Qa'im and help them. By now, even the Popular Mobilization Forces were independent. <laughs> تو عملیات قائم تو آخرش شده مشاوره 
حالا میگه مشاورین آخرش شد مشاور اول نه فرمنده و ستاد بودن و دولت هم میدونستن جلسات مرتبی با این محسوزیر تو هر سفری هم داشتن من هم بودم اکثر جلساتش میگم اگر من قط نبودم حتما خدمت حجی و آی محسوزیر هم بودم و نقش جمهور اسلامی نقش اساسی With the clearance of Iraq and Syria from the existence of ISIS, American helicopters removed the last remaining elements of ISIS and their commanders amidst the dust storm. Hatz Qasim was now much more than just a military commander. He was among the most effective in rescuing two Arab capitals and creating the most powerful public force of the region. He also single-handedly managed to get Russia to intervene against America in the Syrian war. Haj Qasim was now everywhere. Be shoma miguyam, aghay Trump qumar baz. Bedan dar onjayi ke fikr nami kuni, ma dar nazdi ke shoma hastim. Ma millet Imam Husseini, be pors. ما منتظریم مرد این میدان ما هستیم برای شما few months before his speech the head of the CIA had written him a letter a threatening letter that was supposed to be given to him by the representative of Oman but Haj Qasim refused to even take the letter The danger of this symbol of resistance was becoming more and more apparent to America every single day. Haj Qasim had consciously chosen such a path that his life and his death both were detrimental to his enemies. This symbol of resistance who fiercely and fearlessly attacked the heart of the crisis, his support and assurance was something else. In ma'anay ay intansar Allah yansar kun ine ki intansar Allah be shoma barmigarde. Yani agar sahm shoma az yek chizi yek darsad haste. Shoma un yek darsad ro 100 darsad anjam bedid in sahm shomast. Khoda qawl dade 99 darsad ro amal On the Iranian year of 1398, March of 2019, when floods hit Khuzestan, Haj Qasim was there as well. And he was there with his constant companion, Abu Mahdi al muhandis and even though Haj Qasim had gone there for inspection and assistance, the people hit by the floods treated him like an honorable guest. کاش تو یه چیز دیگه می اومدید برامون هوا خوب بود چیز خوب بود یه یعنی قدم تو رو چشم بود ولی الان این مساعدت یه دلخوشی برا خودمون
During these days, one of his friends gave him a suggestion in one of the meetings. He said that the social conditions and Haj Qasim's popularity suggested that he should register himself as a candidate for the next presidential elections. This wasn't the first time that Haj Qasim was receiving such a suggestion. But Haj Qasim's answer was just one sentence, I am a candidate for bullets. كنت في الصلاة بعد انتهاء الصلاة في جلسة تعقيب خطر في بالي ما يلي أن ملك الموت هي فرضية يعني أن ملك الموت جاء إلي وقال أنا ذاهب إلى إيران لأقبض روح قاسم سليماني لكن لكن الله سبحانه وتعالى جعل استثناء وقال لي اذهب إلى فلان وقل له هناك خيار آخر لتأجيل قبض روح قاسم سليماني وهي أن نقبض روحك أنا في ظل هذه الفرضية كنت أفكر في نفسي ماذا أقول لملك الموت أقول له قطعا أنت تأخذني وتهو هیچ راهی برای آنکه از آینده با خبر شویم و بدانیم که چه در انتظار ماست وجود ندارد پس ای نفس بر خدا توکل کن و صبر داشته باش همه چیز از جانب اوست که میرسد و این چنین هر چه باشد نعمت است كنت انا في ال... كنت في البيت وكان في يومها عندي زواج ابني وكنت متعب أنا ما أحضر في الزواج لأن أنا كنت مرتدي عسكري 
وكنت قلق من الطيران الموجود وصعدت امام الغرفه فوق ووصل الي عاجل ان المطار قد تعرض لصواريخ كاتيوش قلت هذا الموضوع عادي انا ما مرتاح بعد ذلك سمعت بالموضوع قالوا لي احتمال ابو مهدي ابو مهدي خابر على ابو مهدي تليفونه يرن فكان ابو مهدي تارك تليفونه بالبيت ما ماخذه معه ولكن في داخلي يغلي شيء بعد ذلك ارسلت اخوه يذهبون الى المطار وارسلوا لي صور من معمولا دوست ندارم خبر ناگوار رو بگم ولی چون این شخصیت شخصیت فوق العاده بوده و صبح جمعه ان شاءالله برای ایشون هم به نیابت ایشون به اصطلاح زیارت نامه بخوانیم دقایق قبل شبکه خبر این خبر متاسف آور رو پخش کردن که سردار بزرگ اسلام شهید سردار قاسم سلیمانی رو متاسفانه آمریکایی های جنایتکار لحظات قبل در فرودگاه بغداد با بالگرد های آمریکایی او رو به شهادت رساندن و همچنین مهندس ابو مهدی وبعد ذلك اجت صورة حج قاسم صورة اليد والخاتم وتذكرت كلامه عندما كان يقول لي ابو الاء ادعو لي ان اقطع عربا عربا ورأسي ماكو وجسمي مقطع قلت له هني انا لك فقد واسيت الامام العباس بكفك وقد واسيت علي الاكبر بجسمك المقطع وقد واسيت الامام الحسين براسك المقطوع ما اصدقك واصدق كلامك واصدق نبوءتك ترای باران با جوی ها بگویید کن ره رو به غمالود زین ره گذر کجا این خون این خون فقط خون یک نفر نبود این پیمانه ای از خون یک ملت بود به صداقت یک ملت به حقیقت یک ملت به رفای یک ملت بودای سرکش کاشفته و سبک بود آغوش می که بی نهایت 
در بیکران قلود است آنجا که بی نهایت در بیکران قلود است از موج ها به جویی آن راز جا گشته و مرولم در دشت خاطر خیش آیا شما نداری زن بینشان نشان زن بینشان نشان دشمن قرار دادن در راه خدا برای خدا و مخلصن به الله و مجاهدت کردن بنابراین انشاءالله خدای متعال به ایشون عجر بده و تفضل کنه و زندگی ایشون رو با سعادت و آقابت ایشون رو با شهادت قرار بده در روز نهالا در ها ما کار داریم من این جمهود اسلامی با ایشون کار داریم اما آخرش باید قرار تایی کار شهادت شد